how my mind plays Little bit of fame, little bit of hate, little bit of change Watch the craze, keep it sane, don't fade away Look how my mind plays Little bit of fame, little bit of hate, little bit of change Watch the craze, keep it sane, don't fade away It is a simple mansion, built of stone and irony, a symbol of freedom invested with the labor of slaves and great statesmen alike. It is like no other place on earth, a house alive with the past and present. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the unconditional surrender of Japan. That a strong and a confident and a vigilant America stands ready tonight. It is an odd place the where the monumental and the mundane coexist. Than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. It is where the most critical decisions in our history are made, and where any American can visit. And of all the things that American independence means to you and to me and to our. My fellow Americans, our Constitution works. Here, the people rule. Now you will journey through time and a day, meeting the people and hearing the stories that give this powerful place its soul. For this is more than just an office, or a monument, or a home. It is an American idea, known as the White House. It is the most familiar building on the American landscape. A house that embodies almost all of American history. Yet we know little about it. From the outside, it remains a distant symbol. But inside, the idea comes alive. house manier and most and even smaller countries are much bigger this isn't the finest house but this is the best house it's the best house because it has something far more important than numbers of people who serve Far more important than numbers of rooms or how big it is. Far more important than numbers of magnificent pieces of art. This house has a great heart. And that heart comes from those who serve. At the White House, there is no such thing as a typical day. For those who serve inside, today will be one of the most intense. These people, stagehands to history, are preparing the house for the visit of Russian President Boris Yeltsin. Hi, Brenda. This is Gary Walters, the White House. How are you today? Fine. Is Jerry in? Each time a foreign leader visits the White House, the president has an opportunity to showcase the power and heritage of the nation in a setting that embodies them in every wall, floorboard, and stone. 
This is the symbol, not only of the presidency, but in the eyes of the world of the United States of America. Nothing compares to the simplicity and the strength. Nothing, nothing in the world like it. The dinners and the, we'll start off with the private reception. The Very shortly, the Yeltsins will arrive. To ensure a flawless visit, there are briefings on a thousand details of protocol and timing. But in terms of the movements, uh, the arrival back here by the car going up to the stage. The high point of the visit will be the state dinner tonight. Dramatic, entertaining, and essential, the state dinner is the ultimate expression of White House power. Mm, not a thing. Not a thing. Okay, we're going to start the uh, escorts out to the uh, South Lawn now. Everyone has More than 200 reporters will cover the visit of the Russian leader. It will begin in a few moments with a carefully orchestrated event called the Arrival Ceremony. Could you uh, repeat the name again, please? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Nadia Ocek from the South Lawn of the White House, checking one, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, seven, six, two on each, five, four, three, two, one. I am Mrs. Gore. I am Secretary Christopher. You've got to get very much. enough room for them to get past here. Right. I am Mrs. Shelley Cashfield. Are you excited about being here today? Yes. Okay. Come on, word. Inside the White House, with only minutes to go, the President and the First Lady receive their final briefing. You return to your position. So I say, I say, and I stop. And the interpreters are to to your left. And the press is all of you facing the press. Afterwards, you come back in here and the The only thing I don't remember is. What are the cues from down here? Both coming and going. He turns his back. That is your final cue. Stand by about 15 seconds. He will turn his back. They will do some more stuff. He will face you. He will cue you at all times. And then we go back and start speaking. And then you come back. Okay. That's when you come. Now when you come, that's when you come down. And then we yeah. bring you back to the stairs. Just, okay. Just remember the consecutive. Okay. Interpretation. Yep. Okay. And your remarks are on the side. Sunglasses. Okay, we ready? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They will open when they pull off. Thank you. <laughs> The White House is so universally recognized today that it's hard to imagine when it didn't exist. But almost 13 years after the United States had declared independence, the city of Washington was still nothing but untamed woodlands. In 1789, Congress agreed to build a new capital city. Ridiculed in New York and Philadelphia, the city and the president's house would never have been built had it not been for one man. Washington wanted the city built. By law, it had to be occupied by November the 1st, 1800, and many forces were acting against this new city in the wilderness. 
Washington wanted it. He wanted it in the middle of the country. He wanted it on the Potomac River. And he was determined to have those buildings because in having the buildings, he would have his capital. Since the idea of a president was new, no one knew what a president's house should look like. Thomas Jefferson suggested a competition to find the best plan, and $500 was offered for the best entry. After receiving several uninspired designs, one of them rumored to be from Jefferson himself, Washington remembered an accomplished builder in Charleston, an Irishman named James Hoban. In no time, this James Hoban appears in Philadelphia at the president's house there. They liked each other immediately, and they sketched out some things. Hoban entered the competition, Washington judged the competition, and Hoban won. Its foundations were dug by slaves, the intricate stonework carved by Scottish masons. More than half the workforce were foreign born. The workers lived at the job site and each morning received a pound of meat and all the cornbread they could eat. After one especially randy night there, the commissioners overseeing the project closed down the only house of prostitution to have ever operated on the White House grounds. When it was finished, it was immense. A bigger home would not be built in this country until after the Civil War. The floor plan for Washington's house has endured with few changes for more than 200 years. On the east side, a large room for entertaining. The south side features three parlors, including the trademark oval-shaped room. On the west, the state dining room. The house closely reflects Mount Vernon, evidence of George Washington's powerful influence on the design and on the presidency. He would walk into a room crowded with people and a hush would fall over the room. Children would be playing in a room and there would be silence when he came in. He had a very majestic appearance and way about him. He was self-effacing. He wasn't pompous or flashy in any way. He had a, a natural majesty about him that poor John Adams, who followed him, never could fill those shoes. But uh, Washington did, and Washington got his way. One time they tried to uh, change the size of the grounds to be around the new palace, as they called it, and Washington wrote a letter, a rather curt letter, about how it was going to be, and at the end he simply wrote, I require it. Washington was building more than a house. He was building the presidency. The house remains one of the president's most useful tools. Today, the power of the symbol is inescapable, something every visiting leader learns upon arriving. At that moment, I become the United States and he becomes Russia and we stand for all of our people. And if this state visit goes well, then it's proof that the Cold War is really over and we're making a newer and better world. And I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> I want to do it right because it's the United States. Conceived by President Kennedy in 1961, the modern ceremony not only impresses the visiting leader, it gives him the distinction of being welcomed here. Uh, 
Together we have agreed to safeguard nuclear materials and to shut down plutonium production reactors. Вместе мы согласились обеспечить безопасность ядерных материалов и проблем, таких как терроризм, улучшение окружающей среды и организованная преступность. Together we can and we will make a difference not only for our own people, but also for men, women and children all around the world. The receiving line's going on right now, inside. President and Mrs. Clinton are receiving the official party. We have a full day, full slate in front of us. We have some canopies to put up yet, flower material to put around. There's a lot of activities going on yet. See you later. All right, Jim, what else we got? In the White House basement, the first preparations for the state dinner are underway. Here, the butlers will find some of the 1,500 different pieces of china to set tonight's tables. It's one of a hundred different tasks the White House staff will finish in their push to the dinner, now 10 hours away. Upstairs, in the entrance hall, a receiving line welcoming the Russian delegation is concluding. Just a few steps away, the china is wheeled into the old family dining room. The White House is barely large enough to hold a dinner like the one planned for tonight. So, this elegant room has been converted into a giant pantry, so butlers like Buddy Carter can serve tonight's 150 guests. There's so many people that are capable of doing this job, but I'm one of the few selected that get to do it. So that's why I take a lot of pride in what I do, and I love it. There are about 100 full-time employees at the White House, and today they are all civil servants. But as late as 1910, almost all White House staff, whether nurse, butler, or office clerk, were hired by the president and paid out of his own pocket. This is the time they do the state dinners by. This better be on time. <laughs> The White House residence staff still serve at the pleasure of the president, but they are managed by someone called the chief usher. Can I speak to Jim, please? Gary Walters has been the chief usher for 10 years. He is a conductor, directing everyone from butlers to plumbers, all the people who serve the family and make the house work. In addition to all those things that you see and wonder how they're going on, there's also those things that are going on behind the scenes. This is still a home. While those activities are going on, you get, uh, Chelsea Clinton getting ready to go to school. Two extra chairs, including Secret Service chairs. Most of the staff end up a career here at the White House and have a feeling of love, awe, responsibility to the presidency in, in working in the House. I mean, we just don't read it or see it. We actually participate in it, behind the scenes, to be sure. But we do, which I think is a better place for us to be. There have been only eight chief ushers in the history of the White House. This small handful of men has prided themselves on lives actively seeking the background, catching the embarrassing moment before it happened, and then slipping unnoticed out of the picture. The most improbably named Chief Usher was also the longest serving. His name was Ike Hoover, and he arrived here in 1891 to help install the first electric lighting. At the presentation of this aviation medal, by the time he left, 42 years later, he had helped manage the house for a third of its life and served 10 presidents. Having someone who is master of the details 
helps make this formidable house livable. When you walk into the White House and know that you're going to be living there, it's, um, it's really, uh, um, it's a hard feeling to describe. You, you, you think, I'm walking into this White House where all these other people walked before me, and all the things that went on. I mean, it's, it's very uh, humbling <laughs> and awe-inspiring, and, and uh, takes a little adjusting. <laughs> Although he built the house, George Washington died before it was finished. John Adams, intimidated by the expense of running such a home, said he'd prefer a row house instead. But Washington's house held irresistible allure. And on the night of November 1, 1800, Adams became the first president to sleep in the White House. Well, he woke up the next morning and he, uh, he wrote a letter to his wife. Uh, it seemed to settle in on him. And it's really, you might say, the first experience you know of of a president having in that house. You see, by now it is the president's house. It seems almost an afterthought, but it's very beautiful. And he says, uh, you know, may heaven bestow the best of blessings on this house, and uh, may none but honest and wise men inhabit it hereafter. The White House was imbued with intense historical meaning for me. Just to think that, that you know, that's where Theodore Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln and Harry Truman and Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy had uh, lived and worked was uh, sobering and, uh, and also exciting. So I would say the first day or so we were uh, kind of like tourists. Over the White House at Washington. Some occupants are thrust into the place without warning. On April 12, 1945, Vice President Truman was urgently summoned to the White House. When he arrived, Eleanor Roosevelt told him the news. Harry, the president is dead. A stunned Truman asked if there was anything he could do. Mrs. Roosevelt replied, is there anything we can do for you, Harry? For you are the one in trouble now. As formulated by the Roosevelt administration. When the Johnsons entered the White House, the nation was still in mourning for President John Kennedy. One of the times that was a th throat gasping time for me was the morning of a December the 22nd when I came down to the first floor where all of the chandeliers had been draped in black net and to come back and see that gone and the Christmas tree brilliantly alight. I think we had it in the blue room. That was just a, you just gasp with sort of a relief and now we are started and life will go on. For the first families, from the moment they move in, life goes on in the public eye. For their own sanity, there must be a refuge. And at the White House, it is upstairs. Only above this stair is privacy absolute. Never, while a presidential family is in residence, may cameras pass beyond this gate. Cameras above the first floor are still rare because this is where the families live. The second and third floors are one of the few places on Earth where the families are not accompanied by Secret Service. At the heart of the second floor is the yellow oval room, which leads to the Truman balcony. And we sit out here, and 
here and have discussions or sometimes we'll have a candlelight dinner here on the balcony. And as you can see, the tourists are over here by the fence and for a change, we watch them. here even after 12 o'clock and work on a speech or think about a problem where he usually thinks about these things is in this chair this was my father's favorite chair there these rooms provide a haven a place safe from everything but history for me i would get so caught up in what i was doing that you forget where you are that this is home but then we'd sit down at dinner at night and here would be Abraham Lincoln's plate. And then it would all just kind of come back. Here I am in this historic house and it was overwhelming sometimes. While overwhelming, this public housing does come with some useful amenities. Living in the White House is quite a dream for any homemaker. There's somebody to do everything. It's not just the wonderful uh, butlers and maids, but if you need a plumber, all you do is pick up the phone and the plumber's there right away. Well, when President Johnson first came into office, the chief usher called me up and said, the president wants to talk to you about this shower. He said, it's come up. So I came up, the president stepped off the elevator coming down, going to the Oval Office that morning. So he told me he wanted more water colder water, and he said, if I have to, I'll go over to the Elms and take my shower. So the first thing I did, I got a chauffeur and went to the Elms to see what he had over there. And uh, we came back to the White House, and we thought we had it, you know, perfect for him. You know, we had it much better than he had at the Elms, but that he wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted 50-degree cold water. He wanted body sprays around him. And then he told me that uh, he wanted a shower head about two feet off the floor. He said, I want a shower head right there. And I said, well, you hold your finger there, Mr. President. Let me mark that spot. In your home, probably you have about eight to 10 pounds of running pressure on your shower head when it's running. His was 110 pounds of pressure while it was running. It was like a, a, a mini car wash. The chief usher was Rex Scouton. He said, I have to try that shower out. And it just kind of pinned him right up against the wall. He said, I don't see how the man can stand it. The President from the United States of America and Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> In the Rose Garden, Presidents Clinton and Yeltsin honor World War II veterans from both nations. On a day like this, when so much must be done, White House staff more than earned their pay. Then we have in the blue room and the red room right. still passing. No, not, we don't pass in the room really. While they're waiting put, to put, go into put this one over there. Yes, sir. And do um, another one of the Reagan China. Oh, this, the employees are like a family because everybody see, you know, it's like you got different departments and everything like that, but it's, it's not operated that way. You know, if you see something that needs to be done, regardless of which department it is, you do it. That's why we say it's like a family. Color right now, Have it too dark. Looks like I need to shave. I think the, the, the people who serve here a long time obviously do it because they love their country as well as loving their jobs. And they're able to be loyal to presidents, some of whom they voted for and some of whom they must not have. Otherwise, I mean, just by definition, if you look at the changes that go through over time. And I think that somehow 
they have the idea and we have the idea that when you live here, you have to, there is a sense in which you can put your politics behind and put your country first. And they kind of symbolize that. There's a marvelous group inside the White House staff, and I'm talking about the White House family, and uh, they have a wonderful way of making whoever lives here feel at home. I remember one time teasing a member of the staff, one of the butlers, and they are really like family and treated our children like family, and I said, if you don't behave, I'm going to get you fired, and he burst out laughing and said, presidents come and go, butlers stay. In 1945, a young electrician named John Muffler came to work here. For the last 50 years, in addition to electrical jobs, he has handled the little annoyances of life for 10 first families, like replacing watch batteries and fixing eyeglasses. You want to do the ground floor, right? Yeah. No one in the history of the house has served here longer. Am I going too fast for you? The man with the longest tenure here, fittingly, also is in charge of time. Every Friday, Mr. Muffler winds the clocks in every part of the White House. How many clocks are there in this place? Several. <laughs> look at the clock, Mr. President. Yes, it's, it's a beautiful clock. And it still uh, keeps good time. Do all these clocks run, Mr. President? Yes, they all run. In every room. We have a special man that winds clocks every Friday. <laughs> I always manage to be there when he'd come in somehow. And uh, one morning he said to me, uh, Son, do you know why when I come into this office, these pictures are all crooked and all bent out of shape? And I said, No, sir, Mr. President, unless, uh, unless the cleaners when they're dusting, they move the pictures around. He said, no, 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 that's not the reason. He said, would you like to know? I said, yes, sir, Mr. President, I would. And he said, the rotation of the earth causes that. I said, yes, sir, Mr. President. <laughs> but he went over every morning, straightened Oh, I love Mr. Muffler. I, I can't do anything like program VCRs or set digital clocks, and so I'm always needing his help to come to my rescue. But he's a perfect example of the kind of dedicated right, service okay. that people have given yeah. to the White House and to presidents and their families over 200 plus years. Only a handful of White House staff develop a relationship with the first families. During the Hoover years, if the president or first lady happened down the hallway, staff were expected to disappear. Some remember jumping into closets, only to find them already occupied. That policy eventually changed. But today, the job is just as demanding. I mean, there were many days when I come home at night, of course, it'd be late, and my wife would be asleep when I leave in the morning. She'd be asleep when I come home at night, and I'd get up and go back to work the next morning, and she'd still be asleep. The White House is, when you really think of it in terms of you know, how important it is and how the people depend on you for to get a, do a job. And those are the things that you have to do to get the job done. It, it's no excuse that the job don't be done. United Nations War Council. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill at the White House. Because of what happens here, even in the wee hours of the night, someone is always on call. Alonzo Fields, White House butler for 21 years, developed a unique relationship with Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Around about 1.30, I decided that the Prime Minister is satisfied, I know. And I was thinking about really going to bed. And uh, the bell buzzed, and I went in. The Prime Minister was walking up and down with this scotch in his hand, talking, quoting and saying different things, and he says, uh, 
Uh, we're trying to find out from the Russians what we can do for them. But what can we do? It's like an iron shade. And then he stopped and stomped his foot. Oh, make out an iron curtain. And the, then he saw me. And uh, my eyes saw the bottle was empty. My poker face didn't fool him. He says, yes, my man, I need some more to drink. He says, I have a war to fight, and I need fortitude. So I proceeded and got a bottle of scotch and opened and poured the Prime Minister a drink. And then I said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, will that be all for tonight? And he says, I don't know. I can't depend on you. Uh, I said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, what is it? And he says, well, if ever I'm accused of being a teetotaler, I want you to come to my defense. I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I'll defend you to the last drop. Whether war or household drama, the staff lives it with the first families. I remember when, uh, when President Carter's grandson, James Earl Carter, the fourth, was, was born soon after the inaugural. I mean, there was a sense of euphoria here at, at the White House through everybody. We had a grandson born the, what, about a month after we moved in, little James. And when we left the White House, uh, at the end of four years, I re will always remember Alfredo holding James in his arms with tears running down his cheeks that we were, that we were leaving. The children, you know, especially the little ones, will remember me for the rest of their lives. And that's exactly two weeks ago, uh, Jimmy came over. Angari is this high and Alfredo. And I was teaching him when he was a baby. Meanwhile, I was giving him the food because I was taking care of him, see? I was teaching him in the Spanish language. Uno, dos. <laughs> and I remember him crying, and Alfredo just cried and cried because he loved that baby. Today, the great sandstone walls of the home are being restored. Patrick Plunkett is the master mason. You know, it's 200 years old. It's uh, showing signs of age. Some very badly decayed stones that have been messed around with over the years with all sorts of different types of cement patches. It needs some, some tender loving care, if you like, you know? The masons have finished three of the four sides of the house, hacking out decayed and crumbling stone and replacing it with new. The replacement stone comes from the same quarry as the original. Because it was porous and vulnerable to the elements, the first masons sealed it with a wash made from salt, rice, and glue. Out of necessity, they produced the first layer of paint that would come to define the house itself. By 1979, there was so much paint on the walls, another layer wouldn't stick. After removing some 32 coats of white paint, workers made a remarkable discovery. Burn marks from the most humiliating event in White House history. It's hard to imagine today, but back in the Madison administration, during the War of 1812, the British Army captured the city of Washington and burned the White House. The Madisons were trying to keep a cheery face on it all, and they uh, had a dinner party. And some of the most amusing in the context letters in the Madison papers are regrets to that particular dinner party that night in August. <laughs> Lo and behold, you could hear the gun fired. Mrs. Madison finally fled herself, left the house alone with Paul Jennings, a slave. Jennings was to bank the fire, ironically, to keep it from burning down. Well, the British came in at 11 at night. They saw the dinner. The officers sat down and had the dinner. Furniture was piled up in the rooms with lamp oil on it. The windows broken out. And at about 1 AM, the British stood with flaming javelins in a circle around the house, and Lieutenant Pratt fired his pistol. The javelins were thrown in the house, and it exploded. Mrs. William Thornton, a British citizen, was there and said it glowed like a great plum cake. 
the White House was reduced to ashes except for the stone walls that General Washington had cherished so. Upstairs on the Truman balcony, we have one block that's unpainted. And whenever we have people up there, I take them outside and I look at it and I say, you remember this house burned in 1814? I, I look at it all the time. Every time we have any kind of international incident, when um, Captain O'Grady was rescued out of Bosnia, I went out on the Truman balcony and I looked at the burn marks. But I'm very aware every day I go to work about how this house carries the whole story of America and how we're still creating that story and what our obligations are. Throughout the day during a state visit, Meetings between the official delegations are held, and the press moves from room to room for photo opportunities. Do you care to respond to the uh, health care situation? Are you Those living here are surrounded by constant reminders that they are not living a private life. I feel as though I've just turned into a piece of public property, Jacqueline Kennedy said, after only two months in the White House. The incessant activity swirling around the White House belies the fact that it sits in the middle of a quiet 18-acre garden. I didn't know, Eleanor Roosevelt once wrote, what a steadying effect the beauty of the house and gardens, the dignity and serenity of the place would have on the souls of its inhabitants. I love to get out and walk all over the place and look at the trees and recall the presidents who planted so many of those historic trees. The oldest trees are three ancient magnolias, still standing more than 160 years after Andrew Jackson planted them. Almost every president has planted a tree. It's a ritual that allows each family to leave their arboreal mark while regenerating the grounds. We too, just like every person, had an opportunity to plant a tree of our choice. And I wanted so much to plant the live oak, which speaks of the hill country, where we, that's home. But it's not their habitat. Just forget it. Plant what will grow well there. So uh, we planted another variety of oak, a water oak. It grows very well in Virginia and the surrounding country. And I, I do look at it whenever I'm back there. The South Lawn has always been the quintessential American backyard. Something between a playground and a formal garden. President Wilson kept a flock of sheep here. And he also welcomed the first autogyro. Each morning during the Hoover administration, the cabinet played an exercise game with an eight pound medicine ball. When Ike installed the first putting green, the stage was set for confrontation with the local constituents. Squirrels have created a nutty problem at the White House with President Eisenhower complaining that the four-legged vandals are tearing up his private putting green. The president, a very earnest golfer, brought on a minor political storm with his decision to banish the squirrels, even though nobody has found out whether the animals are Republicans or Democrats. 
Well, the South Lawn is well inhabited by squirrels. And uh, up at Camp David, I noticed that the oak trees uh, shed acorns to a great extent, and the uh, squirrels didn't do much about them. So when the day came to go back down to the White House, I'd fill my pockets with acorns. And there, oh, up and down and in the rose garden, there would be these squirrels. And I'd throw the acorns out to them and you'd see them, wham, they'd just go and grab for those acorns. One occasion at Camp David, I didn't get any acorns. And when I came back, well, I went into the Oval Office and we were having a meeting there. I looked and in every one of those windows, the squirrels were standing on their hind legs <laughs> and looking through their front legs inside. And, uh, and they're looking at me. <laughs> and they literally, I could see, were saying, where are the acorns? <laughs> At about 3 p.m., the pianist for tonight's entertainment practices in the East Room. One floor below, in the White House kitchen, Chef Walter Scheib is gearing up for dinner, now only five hours away. In addition to the normal pressure to please, turn-of-the-century chefs had to routinely serve seven-course family meals and 20 course state dinners. The pleasures of these meals were not lost on President Taft, who tipped the scales at more than 300 pounds. Though a success in the kitchen, the chef's handiwork was causing problems elsewhere. White House bathtubs proved too narrow for Taft. To his consternation, the president was frequently left stuck in the tub. White House ushers were sent scurrying to find a proper vessel. When it finally arrived, it was 41 inches wide, could hold nearly 65 gallons of water, and all the men who installed it. Tonight's guests will be served low-fat yet elegant fare. An appetizer of ginger marinated salmon, rack of lamb, a salad of mixed greens, and one of the legendary White House desserts. See, that's a really, really nice color there, very nice blonde. Roland Messnier has been pastry chef at the White House for 16 years. Okay, and that goes back. This is when I am even more nervous than normal. You have to remember, you know, when you serve a steak dinner, who are your guests? The dining room is filled with extremely important people, people that have been everywhere, that have tasted all sorts of food. And our job is to make sure that the guests will leave the White House feeling that the President and Mrs. Clinton did an excellent job receiving the guests, not the pastry chef, nor anybody else, but the President and the First Lady. That has to be very, very well understood. And I think if you can do that, then I think you do your job fairly well. Messnier's almond baskets will be the dinner's grand finale. Here we are. Not only backstage... It's a type of culinary touch that has always attracted the attention of gourmets, including Julia Child. who was born in Switzerland, had his While history has recorded the names of almost every White House chef, the names and lives of the kitchen assistants and the servants who toiled on the staff have gone largely unrecorded. In 1909, Mrs. Taft considered firing all of the white ushers because they couldn't be treated like servants in the same way as blacks. She was persuaded not to. Despite the discrimination, Black Americans who worked here then created a vibrant world. Their White House positions placed them in the upper strata 
of Washington's black society. James Coates, Adolph Byrd, and Arlen Dixon, I remember the first three butlers I met during the Taft's administration. Lillian Rogers Parks, a White House seamstress for 30 years, was introduced to that society by her mother, Maggie Rogers, a maid to Mrs. Taft. They had their homes and they entertained. And then we had clubs that was very classy. And that gave them the idea to get together and have a little club at the White House called the Chandeliers. Named for the cut glass fixtures in the East Room, the Chandelier Club, like many social clubs in the early 1900s, held a ball each year. Though it was not staged there, the White House imprimatur made the Chandelier Ball exclusive. The Marine Band played, and White House dignitaries always attended. But outside the ball, black workers were still treated as second-class citizens. In 1902, President Teddy Roosevelt invited the noted educator Booker T. Washington to the White House for dinner. Press reaction in the South and the North was severe. Roosevelt was chastened. No black American received another social invitation to the White House for 28 years. When Chief Butler Alonzo Fields arrived at the White House in the 1930s, he kept a daily diary, monitoring numbers of guests, how much food was served, and the performance of the staff. But on some occasions, like a visit by Vice President Jack Garner, he also recorded what he heard. Now, he was a friendly man, uh, Mr. Garner, Vice President. Hello there, boys. How are you boys today? And, oh, he smiled, and, and I'm sure that he would do almost anything for you as long as you accept that you're boys and, and let you, that, that type of attitude. The President says, how are you doing, Jack? Well, he says, I'm doing better now. He says, I'm down in Texas there, and my belly's so damn big I can't get down to trim my corns. And I've got an old nigger doctor up here that comes down and works on my feet. Now, boss, if you have any problem with your feet, I'll send him over to you. Well, in this, you, you have a twofold situation. He's recommending the man as being good. He said, you want to be satisfied with that. But in, in the way, he's rec his recommendation doesn't give you any, any credit really at all. If you're going to fight, fight to prove that you're better than anything he thought you were. Be as humble as possible, ignore it, and then build a pride in yourself that these people, they, they think they're better than I am. And you can say within yourself, I know what I am. I'm serving the country. In the entrance hall, the honor guard practices for their ceremonial march later this evening. They are performing a kind of ritual that helps define what has become a national shrine. For the occupants of the late 1800s, the White House was too small and not nearly grand enough for the nation's aspirations. There were frequent and elaborate plans to expand or even abandon it. I don't think the White House would have survived the late 1860s had it not been where Lincoln had lived. You think of Lincoln in his nightshirt going down the hall at night with the wind blowing and his dreams that his secretaries told about, his wife's problems, the child's death. It all happened in the White House. And it's from the White House he left in his carriage to go to Ford's Theater. And it was the White House he was brought back dead. It's not too excessive to say that Lincoln sanctified the White House. Shortly after Lincoln's death, the first White House photographs became publicly available. By the 1870s, images of Lincoln's house were everywhere. But for many, 
Simply having a picture wasn't enough. Local police records are littered with reports of otherwise respectable young ladies being arrested for clipping tassels from White House draperies and chairs. Law-abiding relic hunters could actually purchase White House furnishings. Throughout the 19th century, china, chairs, and carpets were routinely auctioned to raise money to redecorate the house. Now, Mrs. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt began to be upset about these auctions. Mrs. Roosevelt was an ardent antiquer. She would practically stop a parade to go into an antique shop and run out with a couple of andirons, you know. She really, really was, a, was an aggressive antiquer. And she would go in shops and she'd see a piece of White House china for sale. She thought this was undignified. So the practice started then of when White House china was beyond use, it was put in toe sacks and smashed. If you inherit a cup and saucer from great-grandmother and think you've got something, you better hide it because she probably swiped it. <laughs> Our fascination with the house is driven not just by its history, but by the uncanny truth about who is eligible to live there. It is true, literally true. No one can deny it, madam. Your son certainly can wind up in the White House. Of course, the odds against your boy are one to three million. But every the odds are even worse today. But the possibility of it makes the idea of the people's house seem plausible. Up until World War II, visitors could walk right in and wander through the state floor parlors. If they chose, they could leave their card with the doorman. Later that day, they would receive an invitation to a tea or other White House social event. And that got so, so democratized, people would pay a cab driver and he would take 20 cards and he'd go back and drive under the uh, portico and the butler would come out and stick the tray in the car window and they'd pile the cards on there and take them in and then the invitations would go out. I was talking to a man the other day who had a convertible around the World War II period and it started to rain and he couldn't get the top up so he just drove in the White House under the North Portico and got out and put his top up and drove on. Don't do that today. It's the way it used to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When Roosevelt was president, I think until the Second World War, every uh, weekend, a Sunday afternoon, uh, during the warm weather, people could picnic on the backyard here. You know, it's just different now. When people abuse their freedom, then we have to live with more restrictions. And so it's uh, regrettable, but we still try to keep this house accessible. Because after all, we're just temporary residents here and it belongs to the people of the United States. That's what a democracy is all about. I used to take some foreign visitors, heads of state, to the tourist line. And, and I did it more for the benefit of the head of state than from the tourists. And I, some of them found it amazing that the house would be that open. We'd say, where are you from? Where are you from? And they'd not only be from any, all or any of the 50 states, but from many other countries. And it made a profound impact on the foreign leaders that I would take there. And I think they got a better sense of the strength of our democracy when they saw that. I know it's true. Now those, those this is what we call pulled sugar which is simple uh, water, glucose, and lemon juice. With only hours okay. to go before the evening right. begins, pastry chef Roland Ooh. Messnier is finishing tonight's Ooh. culinary grand finale. Until you feel that you are, uh, that the Rubens is wide enough, because as you pull it thin, it will get narrower on you. So that's... Just like a baby. Very, very careful. You have to kind of tickle it and massage it and, and be nice to it. See, look at these. Huh? Precision and timing is the key to a beautiful Rubens. 
it makes you very nervous because of the kind of material we're using. See, I mean, you can see it shatters just like these. I mean, you know, one touch and that's it. Uh, one wrong move in the corner of a door. So I think in every state in our age, about two or three years. Messonnier's creations represent the sophistication of the White House staff. But it wasn't always this way. At the end of the 19th century, the president's house reflected the manners of a frontier nation, not the style of an emerging imperial power. It was a home comparable to many other residences from its beginnings. And then enormous demands came upon it. Uh, and we've had a rather imperial community come to Washington. General Grant, goodness, he went out and got an old orderly in the military that was a friend of his to come be the chef. And they had a state dinner, and here apple pie came out and big slabs of roast beef with gravy dripping off of the plates, and Ms. Grant was mortified. These ambassadors didn't know what to do with you, get on the floor and chew it or what? By 1902, a brilliant young man named George Cortelieu had changed all of that. At Roosevelt's request, he created an almost regal White House style that redefined the house for the new century. Quartel U wrote a series of guidebooks for the staff. In them, they could find rules on everything from how to stage a state dinner to how the staff, including the president, should dress for work. The most interesting one to me is the customs for riding horseback with the president. Your stirrup was never to go forward of his. And he would nod if you were to fall back and someone else could come forward and ride alongside him and talk. And of course, with Theodore Roosevelt, who was a wild man on a horse, he was jumping and leaping and going through creeks and his people were following. As part of the new look, Teddy Roosevelt officially changed the name of the mansion. The new letterhead read simply, White House, Washington. Inside the state dining room, with only a couple of hours to go, Chief Usher Gary Walters is struggling with the most pressing problem at the White House, a lack of space. And that one goes up in that gap a little bit, then that one can move over this way, right? How are we doing there? Can we offset one of those? This one can gain the room. No, no. It may seem small today, but for the Roosevelt's at the turn of the century, life in the crowded White House was miserable. Along with their six children, the President and First Lady were crammed into only eight rooms in the west end of the second floor. At the other end of the floor, almost 30 office workers toiled amidst the noise of telephones, telegraphs, and typewriters. Roosevelt solved the space problem and changed the house forever by building a new wing for his staff. It is in the West Wing, not in the house itself, that the most famous room in America stands, the Oval Office. Howdy. How you doing? They're with me, it's okay. Definitely, there is danger ahead. Danger against which we must prepare. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States.
Because of the history that has been made here, the White House is the most potent symbol of power in the world. The power of the House is exploited not only by those who work inside, it is used by those outside the fence as well. Give this Bible to President Clinton, this God's victorious Army Bible. You know, I gave away $50 of my food money to buy President Clinton's Bible. What America really needs is a good fight all around. Agitate the hell out of the president. I mean, he's the one, he's a big, I mean, he's big cheese. Lord bless you, Mr. President. Father, I give you praise in Jesus' name. I give you praise, sweet Jesus. Today, the White House is an obvious and irresistible target for protesters. But early in the century, the idea of protesting at someone's home would have been considered a terrible breach of manners. On January 10, 1917, the nation was shocked when women suffragists began to demonstrate. It was the first time a picket had ever been conducted at the White House. The New York Times described it as petty and monstrous. Others called the picketing a piece of impudence, deluded and dangerous. The nation, one editor wrote, is shamed. For their brazen gesture, 97 suffragists were jailed for six months without a trial. Their arrest was eventually declared illegal and the right to protest in front of the White House confirmed. Our Book of Peace is a book of 38,000 authors, each one of which says with persistent iteration, we demand that profit be taken out of war making. Lou, President Clinton has confirmed that the Bosnian Muslim led government has now asked that the. Perhaps the greatest incentive to protest at the White House is the presence of so many reporters inside the fence. By 1950, a permanent corps of reporters was in residence, operating from the same area Teddy Roosevelt had set aside for them 48 years before. When I first began covering, the press was still kind of in a, a makeshift operation. Uh, they were allowed into the West Wing, which was the reception area, still is, and in the middle was this big Philippine mahogany table and people waiting to see the president would sit down there, and the press would sit down there to see who was coming in and out. We would gather around Jim Haggerty, the press secretary to Eisenhower. He would sometimes say, sorry boys, no story today. And we would accept it, go off, have lunch, take a nap and forget it. So the intimacy in that time was just amazing. And people like myself knew the presidents intimately. Leon, why is it after 20 months in office, the president had to decide who he wanted as his press secretary? But those days are gone. Why did he have to redecide? The odd marriage between the president and the press has grown increasingly adversarial. Neither the press nor the public has the easy access they once enjoyed. The last time a reporter could wander around the West Wing of the White House is 30 years past. Okay. Okay, okay. No, 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 not okay, 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 okay. The last time anyone could walk in off the street and shake hands with the president is more than 70 years past. Access to the White House has always reflected the society around it. Today is no exception. It's a panic at the White House. A crazed gunman fires away. 
Now he drops his empty clip and tries to... The Secret Service did a great job. They said they had him in the fight. The strikes in your out. I guess I'm like, I have to let those strikes. I think he was just like, uh, shooting at the symbol. No, was... In the spring of 1995, Pennsylvania Avenue, the street in front of the White House, was closed forever. Security increased, and the White House became a little more fortress and a little less house. By six o'clock, an hour before the first guests arrive, the White House staff is in a whirl of final preparation. No, no, no. See, they greet these people here. Mm -hmm. They greet these people at the North Portico. There. Each of the head people, the tables have been set up very well. I personally checked them. The front person should check each table to make sure there's not any foliage or anything hanging around. I hope there's nobody here. <laughs> those mundane chores that have to be done. A little romance. That's part of what the evening's about, is some coming back at you. It's part of uh, setting a mood, uh, as well as entertaining guests. We're trying to set a mood, which is a nice, pleasant evening for everybody. Since any of these plates could be the president's, each has to be perfect. Okay, good enough. You know what you're doing. Not just anyone can serve the president and his guests. Besides careful training, each of these waiters has undergone an FBI background check. Oh, no problem. How's your bowling game? The state dining room, like the rest of the house, is ready. But Gary Walters isn't taking any chances. If the chief usher had made a similar inspection of the house 45 years ago, he would have found a few things out of place. In 1948, the White House was completely gutted. The floors that Jackson, Lincoln, and two Roosevelt had walked across were gone. By 1947, with the house crumbling around them, the Trumans moved out. Not since 1814, when the Madisons retreated from the British, had a president been forced to abandon the White House. The house had been used hard. Everybody's in a hurry there. The clock goes like that. When you needed a new bathroom, you just drilled the timbers and sent pipes through. If you needed a sink, if you needed wiring, drill, drill, drill. It was like a cheese. Plaster would powder down from the chandeliers, and at one point, one of the chandeliers jumped down a few links on the chain. When the White House reached the breaking point, Gerald Ford was a freshman congressman on the Public Works Committee. The president summoned them for a tour of the ragged home. I can still recall vividly his taking us into the East Room and pointing to a corner where the ceiling had sagged 18 inches. And he said, under no circumstances would he stay there with his family. Truman was working on sacred ground. He had to save the old house, but build a new one in its place. Workers saved the doors, fireplace mantles, and windows. They copied the detail they couldn't remove. As they rebuilt it, the inside of the house was put back exactly as before. Though it was now constructed of steel and concrete, Jefferson and Lincoln would have easily recognized their old home. You know, when you think about it, it's President Truman and George Washington who did the most to the whole place. But it took a President Truman to do it. An antiquarian would have had nightmares. Oh my goodness, the original beams. Truman said the original beams will cut them into boards and panel the basement rooms with them. And the idea is preserved. 
That's really what it is. The idea of the house and the symbol is bigger than any material part of it. And that has remained intact and is really more powerful than ever today. When the Yeltsins arrive, it will be here, at the formal north portico. But the rest of the guests enter the house through the ground floor. September 17th. Uh, he's the act in L.A. Law. In L.A. Law, okay. My kid will be so impressed. The men have it easy tonight. They are all wearing tuxedos. What's appropriate for the women to wear to a state dinner? What kind of reaction do you think you'll get tonight, Senator? Pardon me? What kind of reaction do you think you'll get tonight, Senator? These people are all very appropriate. All the attention betrays our fascination for these people, for they are our stand-ins. The photographers open the house. Their images take us there to visit and dine with the president, because the vast majority of us cannot. On the left there, Steven Spielberg. Please, and have her call the ushers on this right away. Thanks. We need to keep an open line. We need to keep an open line with the push up there. Right. Okay, it's on the master button. All the guys on the drinks. Let's get the drinks and come up. John's up waiting on President and Mrs. Get ready to come down. Can we move into the dining room, please? Please, one second. No. Okay. Sure, when it's really Tempo starts going up, but if you ever forget that you're actually in this historical place. Oh, yeah, I, I guess so. We have to have an open line way. I just tried. There comes somebody out to say, they're coming, they're coming. Where are they? Where are they? By the time the president and first lady reach the first floor, everything is ready. All the preparations have led to this moment. Now all they need are guests. night, it's a very different thing than what happens at the beginning of the state visit. We will have worked all day long, and the visit will either have been a success or a moderate success or maybe not so successful, but it, it, what you want to do at night is to at least seal the best possible relationship you can between the leaders and the countries. So at night, you really just want them to enjoy themselves. You want them to have a good time at the dinner, to say what they want to say at the toast, and, and just be glad that they could be there. In the family's private quarters on the seldom seen second floor of the White House, one of the most critical moments of the visit unfolds. Here, the President and First Lady have a chance to relax with their guests in the warm atmosphere of a home. Welcome to the White House. I remember speaking with my husband about The press waits at the foot of the grand stair, where in a moment, one of the most formal ceremonies of the state visit will occur the presidential entrance march. I did get the only question, I think, turned up your question. Mrs. Clinton, accompanied by the President and the rest of the 
Federation and Mrs. Yeltsin. The receiving line is charged with excitement because famous as the guests may be, they are about to meet the two most powerful men in the world. And we have admired your patience. The rising anticipation of the evening is peaking by the time the official toasts are made. President Yeltsin should be finished any minute now. He's going a couple minutes over his five minutes. He's up to about eight minutes now speaking. Got the signal. And finally, dinner begins. While dinner continues upstairs, downstairs, the staff is battling back an avalanche of dishes. Working hard, working hard, fellas. Cocktail be seven. After the cocktail, that's when it starts flowing in. Start coming down, and after that, it's nonstop. Do you, do you kind of forget where you are, or do you ever forget where you are? No. no. You know you in the kitchen watching the dry dishes. <laughs> At the top of the winding stair that connects the two worlds, days of work are about to pay off for pastry chef Roland Messnier. I'm Sherbet with a vodka mousse in a uh, nougat basket with fresh golden and red raspberry and peaches. You can eat everything? The whole thing. The whole thing? If you're hungry enough, you eat the whole thing, yes. Straight, please. Very straight, please. On evenings like these, dinner is followed by a performance in the East Room. During the Civil Rights Movement, singer Sarah Vaughan performed here. At the end of the evening, a staff member found her sobbing in her dressing room. When asked what was wrong, she said, nothing is the matter. It's just that 20 years ago, when I came to Washington, I couldn't even get a hotel room. And tonight, I sang for the President of the United States in the White House. And then he asked me to dance with him. It is more than I can stand. Tonight, Diva Kathleen Battle lends her voice to the house. I think one of the attractions of the White House, one of the things that makes it so precious in our country, is the fact that a family really is living there every day. That it's a center not only of, of political power and prestige on a global basis, but has that human touch of individuals enjoying life within those, uh, I guess you might say, hallowed halls. Tomorrow it will start all over again, and every day, for as long as there is a republic. 
Families will come and go, just as butlers and maids do. Dignitaries and old gentlemen who wind clocks. These are the people who furnish this house and give it life. And as they do, an American idea endures. <laughs>